important topics here for all of us, as well as for our online audience. And joining me today is a fantastic panel that can hopefully help us all develop, having listened to all of these conversations over the last four days, help us all develop a better picture of what the global jobs outlook will be. I am joined by, uh, immediately to my left, Nicholas Schmidt, Commissioner for Jobs and Social Rights at the Commission. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, to the far end of the panel, Eman Ezat, Chief Executive Officer of Cap Gemini from France. Welcome. Thank you. Next to him, um, Hisayuki Edekoba, President, Chief Executive Officer and Representative Director of the Board for Holdings Japan. Welcome. Thank you. And finally, last but not least, uh, Zainab Shamsuna Ahmed, Minister of Budget, Planning, uh, Finance, Budget and National Planning of Nigeria. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to start with a very quick poll in our audience. How many of you think that unemployment will rise globally in this coming year? I would say that's about two thirds of the room. How many of you think that real wages will rise over the coming year? Real. Maybe two or three hands. That's less than 5% of the room, perhaps 10% of the room. And I think that's among the issues that we will try to discuss today. Um, one, are we going to have enough jobs? What are the types of disruptions that will take place in this coming year, but also a longer term outlook? And are these going to be good jobs? Are these going to be meaningful jobs? And are they going to pay people well enough, especially in the midst of an rising inflation and a cost of living crisis. With that, I will begin um, our conversation with perhaps just a quick thought on what you've seen in terms of the results of our very quick um, uh, in-person polling, uh, as well as some specific views. And I'm going to turn to you first, Mr. Decoba, because you have global data on the labor market. Where do you think things are headed? Yeah. Uh it seems people are thinking, you know, high uh, unemployment ratio. Of course, you know, there will be, you know, good time and a bad time uh, in terms of uh, economy. You know, we recruit is a, a global tech company uh, which we are serving uh, more than 300 million uh, users, job seekers every month through our services like Indeed.com or Grassdoor. And what we are seeing is. Uh, there are three challenges, especially uh, actually supply side. Uh, number one is aging workforce. And number two is uh, the rapid change of uh, attitude towards work-life balance. And the number three is change of immigration and migration. And the first thing, uh, for example, in 2000. And between 2000 and 2010, in OECD countries, we saw an uh, increase of percentage of working age population. But 2010 to 2020, we saw 2% dip of working age population. And when we think about next, you know, 2020 to 2030, we will see 3.3% of working population dip. So when we think about unemployment ratio, 3.3% is actually a big impact. And it will affect the changes of atmosphere of the workforce and environment, everything. And in the US, you know, one fourth of workers are over 55. Mm -hmm. and, and the second, so the change of attitude towards the work-life balance. Now, you know, compared with before COVID, in the US, for example, we were getting like more than three times of jobs, job postings are having some kind of remote work options. But uh, job seekers are searching five times more uh, about the remote work job. People love flexibility and the remote work. So, that you know, the attitude toward 
uh, work-life balance, especially younger generation, has been changing rapidly. It is very difficult to fill uh, healthcare workers' positions or uh, you know, construction worker positions. And third, uh, changes of immigration and migration. For example, in the US, we had 26, 2015, US had more than 1 million immigration surplus, even before COVID-19. 2019, US had 470,000 immigration surplus, and 2021, it was 270,000 surplus. Not only in the US, UK, Australia, developed, mostly, you know, most of developed countries are having less immigration. That is also very challenging. And uh, to solve these situations, I think it's gonna be very important. We have greater collaboration between technology and people. Technology can unlock people's potential. That's why we think it's gonna be important uh, to make it easier to, 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 to help people to transition uh, jobs of today to uh, jobs of tomorrow. Uh, for example, 70% of US jobs are requiring some kind of you know, mid to high level digital skill, even today. There will be more requirement on employers. Technology will keep disrupting the industry. So even today, you know, our research showed it takes roughly 15 weeks to get a new job. And OECD research showed if people cannot have income for 12 weeks, 40% people will fall below the poverty line. So it is crucially important to simplify hiring, to support people to get a job faster and easier. What we are thinking. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Minister um, Ahmed, let me turn to you next. Uh, how, how does the jobs outlook um, look in Nigeria, and in particular this balance between what we all consider to be the jobs of today versus some of the highest growing jobs of tomorrow. What does that balance look like? Well, in Nigeria, we do have, uh, as a matter of fact, a very high unemployment rate. Uh, with a 210 million population, 60% of that population is about 35 years and below. And what we're grappling with now is how to reskill our tools because our education system is basically designed for just academics and routine white collar jobs. So we are, of course, now because of this, the, the demographics, we have a lot of youths taking advantage of the ICT tools, the digital economy, and creating jobs for themselves. So what we're seeing is more jobs being created now by small uh, entrepreneurs that are using IT systems some of these IT uh, systems like Flutterwave, uh, Jumia are, are today one of the uh, largest employers of labor and also they, they report very high volumes of incomes that they create. Um, we have, uh, as a result of the unemployment, we also have a very high level of poverty. So our, our government has designed a program focused towards reducing um, uh, poverty by creating growth enabling jobs. Um, for example, when we had the COVID, we designed an economic sustainability plan that was targeted at mass agricultural production, uh, putting into use about 20 to 100, 20,000 to 100,000 hectares of land to just put people to work. We created different kinds of um, jobs that enables people to use their hands to work despite the restrictions. We also uh, identified micro, small, medium enterprises and gave them payroll support so that they retain the jobs that they have and also are able to stay stable and, and perhaps create uh, new jobs. There are a lot of schemes that are designed um, with the focus on developing the digital economy 
the ICT sector in Nigeria is today one of the grow largest growing sectors uh, in the country, and it's helping to create more jobs, especially for this large youth uh, population um, uh, that we have. So we see the potential to do more. It's still a very long way off, but we're seeing in t between 2020 and 2021, 9 million new jobs were created. Uh, but we have more students graduating right. out of school that than the number of jobs that we create. And we realize that the only way we can even up and do more is actually using the digital uh, economy. We have um, a lot of youths now doing jobs, outsourced jobs, serving other economies around the world, working from home. We have uh, organizations that have closed uh, physical offices during the COVID, but still are working virtually. So there's more of, uh, like my colleague in the panel has said, an improved work-life balance. And um, uh, a lot of people are used to this new um, style of work and really wanted to, to stay on. Even government is, is working in a hybrid uh, manner. We have people staggered coming to work in, in phases and the people that are at home work from home. And um, we saw an increase in productivity in government work during the COVID higher than before the COVID. It was, it was very strange. Um, but, um, we didn't need to have all the people that we had to work because only one quarter of the workforce was uh, allowed to come and stay and work in the, in the offices from the middle to the lower cadre were at home for almost 12, 12 months. The ones that needed to work were working, uh, working virtually. So we, we continuously track the uh, processes. We have Google recently bringing in into Nigeria and, and a submarine cable that is going to enhance the speed of our internet um, uh, connection. So it will enable more, more of these youths to work uh, virtually and also create their own businesses that they can run and employ people. Thank you very much. Um, very helpful and I think giving us a good picture of um, sort of advanced economies as well as what is happening in emerging markets. The experience that you shared comes through in a lot of the data in other, other developing and emerging markets as well. Uh, Commissioner Schmidt, could I turn to you next? Um, what are some of the um, trends that you are seeing in Europe and also how is the, the deal part of the European Green Deal, um, helping workers through this technological transition, the green transition, and a lot of the social polarization that we currently see. Yes. Um, first, uh, I, I would say that we are in a globalized world, but the problems are quite different. And uh, what we hear now from uh, from our Thank friends you. from Africa. We hear the, the same approaches in Northern Africa and other places in the world. So I think uh, Europe, Japan, and also the US are in a different, uh, in a different <coughs> world in, in relation to jobs and, and, and employment because of mainly of demographics uh, being one of the main issue. Now, uh, what is the, the trend in Europe? We have seen after the pandemic, which was uh, really uh, a very heavy recession, even heavier than the previous one during the financial crisis, we had a, a very st strong, uh, bold recovery. And, uh, and uh, especially uh, the labor market recovered also quite rapidly. Um, now there is uncertainty due to the war. Uh, we have a new forecast which uh, uh, show that um, the, the recovery is losing uh, some steam, but the labor market pro uh, forecast are still good. And I think there is a mixture of uh, also demographics and what you said about the aging working population, people moving out of the labor market, but also uh, it seems a very strong um, hiring tendency among companies because uh, uh, companies are in a process of change. Uh, technological change, you have mentioned it, digitalization. And uh, finally, we noticed that uh, what we feared, that the digital revolution uh, prepared some kind of a world without work. 
uh, this is not really the scenario which, uh, which will happen. So we see that uh, digitalization certainly uh, uh, destroys a lot of jobs, but at the same time creates a lot of new jobs. But the, the new jobs are quite different from, the, from those uh, disappearing. So I think this is the major challenge, how we can organize this transition, how we can skill, reskill, upskill, how we can also better organize our education system to the new challenges of the labor market and the skills needed on the labor market. This is a, a big issue. Now, we have uh, launched this big program on the, uh, of the uh, Green Deal and, and especially also a big investment program. 750 billion, Europe has, uh, uh, which is uh, mainly focused on uh, promoting the Green Deal, the change uh, because of climate change, and, 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 and uh, digitalization, focusing on investment uh, in, in big companies, but also in smaller companies, mainly smaller companies, because the digital uh, challenges uh, among SMEs, how can we really push SMEs to? And there's one issue I, I, I liked also to, yeah, it's entrepreneurship, how we can also foster entrepreneurship, how, how because digital opens a lot of new possibilities in that, in that, uh, in that, uh, uh, um, in that uh, uh, frame. So I think uh, the prospects for Europe are positive, unless I always say the uncertainty will become much bigger and we are heading for a real catastrophe, which never can be excluded. But uh, in, the, in, the, in the present juncture, I would say the labor market are quite strong, quite solid, but there are a lot of challenges on the labor market linked to the changes in the type of uh, jobs uh, which, uh, uh, which uh, we will have. And, and this change is going extremely fast. So I think this is a responsibility for public sector. It's a responsibility also for companies to invest a lot of money into reskilling and upskilling. Uh, and uh, I think uh, if we can do that, well, uh, there is a, the, the employment issue for Europe is not uh, are, are quite good. Thank you very much. Um, you pointed out in the beginning that a few years ago we would all have been talking about the robot revolution um, and automation and digitalization replacing a lot of jobs. And I think what we've seen happen is very much this augmentation, but not without a reskilling revolution, which has been very much front and center here, here at the meeting. Um, Mr. Eza, you are very much in the present um, of, of jobs that we normally describe as the future of jobs. So please tell us more about your workforce and how you've done some of those adaptations. So if you look at uh, our business, right, so we're in the technology consulting business, so we help our clients actually move to the digital economy, right, that's our mm -hmm. business. And we are made of talent, 70% of our course is talent, so for us that's the main input to be able to do our work. Uh, what we have seen is a massive increase in terms of demand over the last 24 months. You know, actually, the, the, all the COVID situation fueled and, and accelerated all the demand for digitalization. And we have to realize when we talk about things like electric vehicles, that's digital. When we talk about energy transition, we are in digital. When we talk about moving to a sustainable economy, all this is driven by digitalization, it's not just about automating processes, it's really about creating new platforms, new businesses, which are all digital. That has increased demand, the demand for, for, for technology skills massively. And what we see today is a massive imbalance between supply and demand. Right? And it has several things. First, um, when you talk about increase in terms of uh, purchasing power, I can promise you our employees do have an increase in terms of purchasing power because the cost increase in terms of compensation are absolutely phenomenal, right? And we compete with uh, the technology firm, we compete with our clients, we compete with startups, we compete with everybody for, for, for these skills. So that's the first thing. Second thing, a lot of projects are being put on hold. So as moving to a digital economy is one of the future you know, drivers of economic growth, we're actually not having enough skills. We are slowing down that transition. Just to give you an idea about numbers, we have increased our workforce by 55,000 people globally in the last one month. Okay? We hired more than 100,000 people to be able to do that because people leave as well because of the attrition. So we're feeding the digital economy. 
but it is not enough. We still have more demand. We, we let things go by because we just cannot pursue them. So this is just to give an idea about the, the significant imbalance that there is today in, uh, in this and, and the importance to be able to, to build the skills to be able to feed the, the, the future economic growth. Now, the solutions. One, there needs to be a lot more upskilling and training. There is not enough. Actually, companies are not investing enough. I mean, some companies do. You know, there's a big US telco that committed $1 billion to reskilling half of its workforce. There is a, a big aerospace company in, in Europe, for example, taking 600 people that have no technology background and training them over six months in, in, uh, in technology skills, in data. And we have to be, get out of the idea that technology requires engineering, engineering uh, degrees. We will not have enough supply of engineers to be able to feed the economy. We need to create short courses of two years, you know, like the apprenticeship model of, of the Industrial Revolution, you know, like we had in Germany for manufacturing. You need the same thing. You need software engineers, you need data specialists, you need cyber specialists, you need cloud, you need connectivity. These people can be trained in two years. Today, we cannot find enough people with a technology background. So we picking up people, assessing them on basic skills and training them. And we have to do a lot more of that, you know, and we have to work. There needs to be a lot more public-private, you know, collaboration on that because we need, you know, in, in Netherlands they have a very good thing where, where the, the, the private companies are involved in helping define the courses, you know, for, for, for education. And actually they sit on the boards to validate these courses to be able to create actually these new skills. We have to do a lot more of that. There needs to be a massive reskilling of digital economy. I know we have that number to get to 20 million you know, digital employees by 2030. I promise you, it is not enough to be able to feed the digital economy. We need a lot more. The second thing, which I think is important, is we have, companies have to think differently. They have to think differently about talent. You have to think about how do I get the talent to get the work done not how do I hire the people to get the work done. Because some people, as we said, want to work 100% remote. Some people will never work for us. They don't want to work for a 340,000 people organization. But they're interested in some projects. So how do I create a talent ecosystem that includes my employees, but other potential gig workers, potentially people who have retired, students, people that I identify associated with me, that will come and come work with me on a project, on a special assignment, but will never be my employees. So companies have also, even governments, have to think differently about how to get the work done, how do we build the talent ecosystem, and not how do we hire people to get the work done. Because people want a much more flexible environment. The, the, the workforce has become much more fluid. We'll never go back to what it is before. Attrition rates in companies will increase because people will move much faster from a company to another, from a project to another, because they don't want to have a career you know, for five years and being told this is how your career wants to look like. They want to say, I don't want to be told that. I want to decide what my future is going to be look like. Right? And that's the new generation we have to deal with. So we need to create a much more flexible work environment, hybrid work environment, have a lot more empathy, caring, for people, less direction and telling them what to do, more enabling them. It's a complete evolution as well in terms of leadership uh, approach, you know, to be able to get this, also keep this workforce, which has completely changed, you know, in the last 10 years. And that's what we see today as being some of, some of the challenges we have to deal with. Thank you so much. Very diverse perspectives in terms of what the job's outlook and trends will be, but I think a lot of commonality in terms of the red threads around skills, um, the red threads around the agency of people and the type of work that they want to do, and the importance of digital and connectivity. We have a little bit of time for questions from the audience. Um, please say your name, your organization, and please keep your question brief. Over to you. Just please wait for the mic. Thank you. My name is Jira, I'm a global shaper from the Bern Hub. Um, my question is very specifically, how would you see the universal basic income, specifically this, like as one of the steps to make sure that nobody is under poverty, um, while you can implement the upskilling that all of you had been mentioning? 
And is your question directed to someone in particular? Uh, no, I think so. All of you mm -hmm. mentioned the problem of ups, um, upskilling, so therefore... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which one of you would like yeah, to... Yeah, I mean, I, I can start. I mean, there is something very important today which wasn't available before. We have unlimited amount of training capacity. Mm. Okay? We hired tens and tens of thousands of people during the pandemic that we don't know. We onboarded them, we trained them, we deployed them on project. We were running at 97% work from home. Okay? So can we train people? Yes. Can we make digital inclusion work? Yes. So we can bring a lot more people in the workforce and a lot more people working remotely. We just need to be able to be connected, you know, and to identify you. Once we do that, I can train you. If you have the basic skills, if I assess you have the basic skills, I can train anybody, mm. anywhere in the world. I mean, we, had, we have completely unlocked the idea about borders, you know. Before we had a project in Sweden, we need to have people in Sweden, okay? Or they are working from India. But this was kind of the duality. Today, during the pandemic, we didn't care. We had project, people sitting in the Netherlands working on projects in Sweden, people sitting in Germany working properly in France. Mm. So the geographic location is completely unlocked for a lot of these jobs. And we have to take advantage of that, and we can train a lot of people. So the connectivity and, and bringing to people connectivity is the most important things to be able to deal with some of these issues and take people out of poverty and train them on some of these new skills and give them jobs. That's fascinating. Can I just ask you one quick follow-up question? There's been so much conversation about globalization, deglobalization here when it comes to trade in particular. I mean, is your view that we're going towards a very globalized digital labor, mar labor market? It is. It is definitely. Because today, we, we have, so we need to be able to recruit people. We need some physical locations for people. Mm -hmm. But we're opening in many places and we're hiring everywhere. The, 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 the beauty of work from home is remote work, is not work from home. Okay? So I don't care where people are. We have to be careful around certain things. Some clients will not ask us not to work from some countries, etc. So that we have to deal with some of these constraints. But today, when I accept people to work 100% remote, I don't care whether they live in France or in Germany. I don't care in which city, if they live in a village or they live in a big town. So part of my population, we cannot deal only with remote workers 100%, but part of our employees are going to be 100% remote workers. And that unlocks plenty of places. It, deals with, it helps deal with territorial issues. It helps deal with how can you keep people in villages. So there's plenty of positive things that are coming from work from home that people don't realize that are very important to consider for the future. Great, thank you. Would anyone else like to come in? On I, I, I just question? wanted to add that th this is truly where we are right now is, is a world without borders. In terms of jobs, people stay in any part of the world and work in other parts of the world. You don't need visas, you don't need work permits. All you need is your computer and your artwork. Thank you. Can just a word on, on the uh, universal income. That's the question. Well, I think that the idea of a universal income uh, to everybody and then uh, those who want to work or can work, we work and others have to live on universal. I, I, I'm not convinced by that. But what I'm, I think is that we have, because the, the life cycle of work is changing because people moving from being uh, an employee to being self-employed, uh, passing through transitions uh, where they have to reskill uh, and so on. So we have to make sure that these transitions, people are in uh, some secure situation. So uh, if I am in a process of being reskilled because my job has been uh, 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 has disappeared or has uh, fundamentally changed, I have to be sure that I have an income. So uh, this is not a universal income, but there has to be a situation where people have an income uh, during this whole uh, uh, professional cycle they are going through. So I think we have to re designing uh, our, our also not only the, the world of work, but also the world of uh, social uh, social benefits. For me, this does not mean uh, unemployment benefits. Mm -hmm. Finally, we should uh, get rid of this idea of unemployment. People should be in a transition where they are reskilled and also during this period to get an income they can have a decent life of. Uh, saying, well, you get the income and then I take, take care of yourself, I am not interested. 
this would discourage finally a part of people perhaps because there are studies which were made in, in, in Finland for instance to say well I can also live without. So I think this is a societal issue uh, of, of high importance. Thank you. Bettina, could we have the microphone here? Thank you very much, uh, Bettina Shalo with the ADECO group, and thank you for this session. Uh, clearly, and I'm completely objective here, one of the key sessions, in my view, uh, at the SUS <laughs> Forum. I'd like to build on what was actually just said and another big topic at this SUS Forum, which is the metaverse. What does this mean for the world of work? And I'd love to hear, actually, the perspectives of every one of the panelists. the metaverse as a tool for work. Please go ahead. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, as everybody is saying, uh, it's very important to reskill, upskill. It's probably including, you know, metaverse skill to sell something through metaverse. But uh, I think it's, you know, probably the job thing will be more global, including metaverse. You know, somebody is working from Africa, somebody is working from everywhere. But I think, also, we need to be very careful to think about the gap between the digital economy and local economy. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is, you know, as I said, the very important thing is the job market is becoming really, how can I say, the job seekers are empowered. They know many information now, right? Compared with 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even just 10 years ago, in the US, just three, four percent of employers are disclosing the expected salary. And we struggle to you know, ask employers to disclose it. And it's becoming more transparent. As a result, job seekers are way more empowered. So as a result, of course, through COVID-19, we know that essential workers are so crucial for society, but uh, okay, global jobs, data of jobs, we need to upskill, reskill. Yes, but we need primer, right? So I think, of course, there will be a new you know, trend from metaverse or digital, but uh, at the same time, we definitely need to be very careful how to revalue these essential jobs, essential <clears throat> workers, to be a part of our society. That's what I'm thinking. Thank you very much. And, and let me actually just very quickly build on that. Um, we launched earlier this week a Jobs of Tomorrow um, report here uh, at the forum. And we, we were going to look, it's going to be a series, and we're going to look at social jobs, tech jobs, and green jobs. And this one was starting out on social jobs. And that includes care jobs, education jobs, and health jobs. Uh, all three that we know we're going to need a lot more of and possibly lend themselves a little less to hybrid work or to virtual work, um, depending on how, how they're being done. And there is a, for every dollar invested in social jobs, there's a $2.3 return, in addition to massive multiplier effects simply because of what those jobs do in society. So how do we solve for some of that? Let me jump in with that question and then I'll come back to audience questions. Sorry, can you rephrase? So how would we solve for in this, in this future of jobs that we're mm -hmm. talking about here, where so much of reskilling and upskilling is really around digital jobs and ensuring that people can work in the digital economy. For these essential roles that we know we're going to need so much mm -hmm. more of in society, how do we ensure that these are valued, these are high paid roles, these are high skilled role, roles and become attractive options for people? Yeah. I you know, what we're seeing every day from our data is it's very difficult to attract, especially younger talent uh, to, you know, apply these uh, jobs. And I think, you know, actually payment, you know, hourly wage is becoming less important. I think very important thing is, you know, flexibility or the environment of jobs and you know, and also more like a purpose-driven type of, uh, you know, communication between workers and employers. And we're seeing like really high turnover rate from healthcare workers or, uh, you know, construction workers. So I think, of course, we need to pay more 
but uh, we also need to think how can we maybe train employers to mm-hmm. build better uh, workplace. Sure. Uh, just beyond that, at least for, for our type of population, we see a lot more importance around the purpose of the company, what do you stand for, how do you care about your employees and care about society and your stand in society. Uh, aspects like diversity and inclusion are absolutely fundamental. I mean, as CEO, if there's something happened, I get challenged, I get emails, I get things on long LinkedIn, you know. So it, it is absolutely important to have purpose-driven companies that have a role in society and stand for something. Uh, as I talked before, the leadership has to completely change. It's not about management, really have to move away. It's about caring and enabling people, not telling them what to do, but giving them a direction, giving them priority, giving them the means, and letting them express themselves. If not, they leave. They don't want to be told, this is how you do things. They want to be given the freedom to do that. It's about reopening projects to people. People can decide on which projects they, 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 they're going to go. So all this evolution in terms of flexibility, agility, transparency, you know, we post jobs and opening on projects. We don't tell people you go on this one, we tell them on which one you want to go. Mm. And if you don't make that happen, then employees don't stay. And so transparency, authenticity, diversity, you know, these are very important words today if you really want to be able to attract people and to get them to stay in your company. Thank you. If I may, uh, I think uh, just to address the part of your question that speaks to specifically to social work, and I'll take example of the health sector. <clears throat> in Nigeria, we've been losing health workers in droves. Our workers, nurses, doctors, are leaving for different parts of the world because they are getting much, much a higher pay than we can ever pay them. Mm-hmm. So. We really are now at a situation where we're looking at what do we do because we are getting to the point when we will, where where our hospitals are getting stretched because the workers are are leaving, Uh, and um, so so it means these workers are well trained, and they have the experience, and that's why they're well sought after. But we're suffering because of what is happening right now. We're looking at how we can upgrade their pay to, to within the limits that we can, but also to create a more flexible work environment and also retool the, um, the equipments and the tools that they, they work with. Because some of them that we spoke to um, have said that the work environment is difficult in the sense that they don't have new tools that they could use to help their patients. So for us, it's, it's, um, it's, it's actually life-threatening for a lot of people because when you're losing doctors or specialists that you have trained over years, you've invested in, and then one day they get a better offer in some country and they just get up and go. It's a very difficult situation. And we're looking at how to uh, address it. Great. Thank you. Commissioner? Well, I think the, uh, the digital is fundamental, but there are other jobs there. And there are other jobs shortages there. And the care sector is one of them. And finally, uh, especially in, in Europe, and in Japan and in some other parts of the world, aging population means the need for more care workers. And uh, because uh, uh, we do not have these care workers. And that's why exactly what you described, we attract people from different other parts of the world who have been trained as nurses or doctors to Europe to take care of uh, you know, health systems or our uh, care institutions. And I think this is a challenge also for our societies. It's the question what you said about value in our societies. How do we value a a certain type of work? Well, uh, there is the need for plumbers. Uh, I I said already we are uh, we are have committed we are committed to renovate our buildings now for for CO2 reasons mainly. And we do not find the plumbers, we do not find the workers to do these jobs uh, because nobody wants to do that. Uh, So I think we have to change. It's a question of pay, certainly, but it's more than a question of pay. It's a question of value in our society. Mm -hmm. How does the society consider certain jobs, certain professions, certain 
educational courses also. When you are an apprentice, you are considered, well, that's nice to be an apprentice, but finally uh, you have a failure behind, otherwise you would be uh, some kind of uh, academic, uh, 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 otherwise you would have chosen an academic career. And therefore I agree fully with what you have said also on the training uh, approaches. So I think this is a challenge. We have to revalue certain jobs uh, because some jobs cannot be uh, outsourced or delocalized or done on platforms. These are the people who have worked during the whole pandemic. They could not stay at home. They are, uh, they are on their job. And this is a, a challenge for our society uh, for training. Certainly part of uh, digitization can make things easier. This is also mm -hmm. make things easier in Japan, uh, especially one tries in care work to introduce. Mm -hmm. But at the end, the human the human dimension has to be there. Yeah. And that, that's the big challenge. And this is also a question for our friends in, in the South because we attract their people they have trained. And this is already the case also right. uh, uh, in, in Europe. Thank you. Uh, we can take one very brief question if you want to come in. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for the panelists. Uh, my question is direct, uh, directed to Minister Ahmed. Uh, as we know that the African continent is the youngest continent in the world. We're looking at over 1 billion uh, young people under 35. And uh, I'm curious to know also Nigeria being the most populous country in Africa, what is uh, Nigeria's plan to well position as young people to you know, as Mr. Azat uh, discussed in detail about the future of the job market, how do we uh, prepare our young uh, leaders in Africa and in Nigeria to make sure that they don't fall behind the rest of the world when it comes Thank to you. digitalization, but also other sectors that we discussed. In Thank, you. Thank you. So, um, I think at the beginning, I, I said um, we, uh, we have designed a, a, a job strategy and we have clearly seen that we must re skill and retool our youths. We have a very large population of youths. And they are vi very vibrant, very entrepreneurial, and very eager to learn. And a lot of uh, the youths are embracing ICT to do different kind of things, including um, working for themselves as entrepreneurs, but also creating jobs in the, in the process. So we have a national digital economic policy and strategy that has placed special emphasis on retooling different uh, categories of jobs. And um, we also have a, a policy that we call 100 for 100, policy for production and productivity. It's been launched early this year. And the idea is to provide um, special funding to uh, low cost finance, and so it's loans, right, to businesses that want to expand and retool their businesses so that they can do more and also employ uh, more, more people. And already there's a large uptake for this um, from, the private, from the private sector. It's clear to us that it's not government that can create the jobs. So we're not making much effort to create new jobs in government, but to support the private sector and enable them to create the jobs that we need. Thank you. Uh, I do want to ask all of you for one final comment. Um, for somebody who is a teenager who is watching this conversation today, will be joining the labor market in a few years' time. What's your one piece of advice to them? And I'm going to call on you, Mr. Azad, first. I'm going to be a bit biased, right? I mean, there's a massive <laughs> potential future company. in digital economy. You know, get, get, jump on one of these jobs, whether you like cyber or artificial intelligence or software development or... And, and choose your industry. You know, you want to work in in e-health. You want to work in uh, on the auto sector. You want to work in utilities. All these industries, any industries today, provide opportunities for digital. It's not just working for digital companies. It's working for any industry because they all have opportunities around digital. Great, thank you, Mr. Jacoba. Yeah, of course. You know, it's very important to get the you know digital skill. But uh, what I have been thinking is, what is good job? So I think good job. You know, the, when I saw the really passionate chefs, great, you know, that is a great job. So uh, we need it. So I think, you know, I will ask people, you know, young people, hey, think about it. What is what you can be passionate of? 
that's your good job. That's what I'm thinking. Hmm. Thank you. Minister. I, I will advise the youth to um, just pick whatever interests them the most and learn new ways of doing those things better. So whether you're a carpenter or a plumber or you're a software specialist, you need to reskill yourself and retool yourself to be able to expand your opportunities to, uh, uh, to work for yourself. That's our emphasis, uh, helping you to work for themselves, but also to get better jobs. Thank you. And Commissioner, you get the last word. <laughs> well, I would say to uh, every young person, get a good education whatever, in whatever field, but try to get an education. An education in the field you, you think you are best fitted for. And uh, the second one, be ready also that this education might not lead to your job for your whole life. That there are other, a lot of opportunities waiting for you, but this means that you have to be open to, uh, to new knowledge, to new skills, and that uh, finally this is not a constraint. This is uh, finally an opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, there you go, the Global Jobs Outlook. Um, if you are working with the World Economic Forum, please also join the reskilling revolution. I think we saw that come through. And here at this meeting, we announced a new jobs consortium that we'll be looking at developing more of the jobs of tomorrow as economies recover. Thank you so much, Mr. Ezzat, Mr. Edekoba, <laughs> Minister Ahmed, and Commissioner Schmidt.